Hi, how's it going? So, we're finally going to do it. Vulcan ray tracing. Now, just super quickly, this is compute shader ray tracing. This isn't the hardware accelerated stuff. There's various reasons for that. Honestly, I'm pretty confident in the performance that I'm going to get out of this. And maybe at a future point, we'll look at hardware accelerated ray tracing. Who knows? This video, this first video in the series is also going to be a little bit informal. It's going to be a bit of a sit down because, well, how do you ray trace in Vulkan? First thing you need to do is set up the whole program. And that takes time. I mean, it takes a little less time because I'm adapting my previous Vulkan code base, but it's definitely not something that I wanted to explicitly write out line by line. It's too much. That's too much, man. That's too much. Okay. So just super quickly, I will talk about some of the changes that I made. So oh, I don't have my notes on me. One of the big things is the pipeline. So if I just open up the engine, I have got now not one pipeline, but multiple pipelines. What's different about that? absolutely nothing. I had that before, but the big thing is if I just go to the bit where I build my pipeline, I'm making a traditional rasterized pipeline in order to draw the screen. But before I do that, I need to run a compute shader and output to an image, which will then be used as the texture for the screen. In order to do that, I need to make a compute pipeline. Now, what's the difference between a compute pipeline and a a standard render pass pipeline. It's it's quite big. Um, it's significantly simpler to construct a compute pipeline. All we need to specify is the SPEAR V code, which we're going to be running, and the descriptor set layout, so the resources which are going to be attached. And that's it. That's all we need. So if you're interested, I mean, of course, as always, code is provided, and I would recommend looking through it. But if we look at this compute pipeline builder, the only thing we really have is specify compute shader, set descriptor layout, and build. That's it. If we have a look at, it's a little all over the place today because I'm just informally describing the steps that I went through, but okay. All we need to do is use the same code that we were using before, but we just create the, um, the shader info and specify that it's going to be used in the compute stage. That's it. It really is almost that simple. Compute shaders are much simpler than standard stuff. In fact, I almost wish that I could get away with not creating a render pass at all and just copy the raw data to the image and then present that on the screen. Unfortunately, Vulkan wouldn't let me get away with that, but that's another thing. So. The only other big thing, I guess, besides the pipelines is the image that we're rendering to. Now, the image that we're rendering to has two uses. It's a storage image, which is essentially just a big allocation of memory that we can work with. Image, storage image. Okay. So it's very similar to a texture, except when we create it, we, we don't load a file to it. We just allocate some amount of size pixels. Now for the usage, we need to specify that it will be used as a storage image, but then we're also going to be reading off it to put it onto the screen. So it will be sampled as well. We'll have that. We'll make it device local to speed up the usage. So this image layout transition is a whole, this is a whole thing. I'm going to transition it to the general layout. Now general is the layout which works with everything. Now here's the really, if I can just insert this rant, here's the really perverse thing about image layout transitions. Uh, when I was at Vulcanize 2023, the convention earlier in the year, I talked with some people who knew what was happening, who knew what was happening, knew what was going on. And they said that in most graphics cards, an image layout transition is a no-op. But if you don't put an image transition with the appropriate enum, it will throw a validation error or crash the program or, or kill the frame rate or do crazy things. But anyway, I, I probably cut.
cut most of that stuff because it was just rambling. But let's go to the render stuff. Is this render? Okay, this is render. Sorry, I'm just... I get motion sickness when I flash this code past my eyes. There's so much of it. Okay, so first thing we do is I run this image barrier. This, uh, this Vulcan barrier, and that essentially grabs the image and transitions it from an undefined layout to a general layout. Um, and that happens at this basically at the start before anything occurs, and the transition occurs right before the compute shader writes to the memory contents. And that has to be done every frame. Now, what I did find is I was then attempting to when I was playing around with layout transitions, I was trying to get it from a general layout to a color attachment layout, and it was—it just wasn't working. It was just really messing things up. I even ran RenderDoc, and I couldn't get to the bottom of it. So I actually went with this dummy transition, which just goes from a general layout to a general layout. Okay, so after I said that, I stopped recording, sat down for five minutes, and just fixed the problem that I spent like an hour or two on last night. Hey, it's fine. Maybe I was tired. So here's the here's the situation. When I make the color attachment, we have that when we load it. Of course, we keep what was previously in there. When we store it, yeah, that's fine. Let's let's keep it there. Now the initial layout will be um, color attachment optimal because of course we're about to write it to the we're about to write it to the screen so then when we go back to the engine we do our thing we transition it from undefined into general then it's in a general layout so we can dispatch the ray tracer we can use that texture as a storage image no problem and then the trick is we need to enforce this barrier before the next render pass begins. We'll be getting a new render pass in this draw commands. So at this point, before the render pass begins, we need to transition it from a general layout into a color attachment optimal layout. And that is not there. <laughs> Here we are. Okay. And that is occurring. So the barrier is between the memory write of the compute shader and basically the beginning of the next render pass, which is uh, top of pipe. We go from general to color attachment optimal. And I think this is actually improving the performance a little bit. So I think before I was getting just, just on 4,000 and now it's variable. Oh. Uh, it could just it could just be in my head anyway that's fine at least we've got no errors okay if you enjoy my rants just comment down below say nice rants but we need more of them nice rants but there's a problem we need more rants okay so so um as for the compute shader itself i think i've looked at this enough the compute shader is in a dot comp file and it's very simple at the moment we just specify the version number now i'm going with a subgroup size of 64 8 pixels by 8 pixels i talked about this in a in a recent video but i just found out about this so previously i would be dispatching basically one compute unit per invocation here per subgroup but it turns out that the gpu can handle well, certain GPUs have certain limits. Um, AMD can handle 64 compute units. NVIDIA typically can handle 32, but it also handles 64 just fine. And this actually speeds it up quite a lot. Anyway, so all we're doing is we're just grabbing the current position on the screen. And then we've got this pixel and we're just writing the pixel to that screen. So if I were to run this right now, there we go. As you can see, yeah, we're writing to the screen. No problem. And it's not a fluke. I can um, change that value. Let's make it really, really red. All I have to do is recompile the compute shader. Oh, there we go. Perfect. 
maybe not perfect that's not a that's an angry red but for our purposes it's okay so like i said this is a bit informal really it's it's just briefly talking about how i set things up but let's go ahead and put a single sphere on the screen so first of all i'll declare the sphere structure And then I'll go ahead and declare a camera. Excellent. And then a ray. Now I'll just go ahead and declare the, um, the hit function that I'm going to use. And I'll go ahead and define it down below. So this is a ray tracing in Vulcan series, but, uh, and I mean, I will be going through concepts when they naturally occur, but just for this first one, the concept of how to do ray sphere intersection, I've gone through this so many times. I am just going to present this. There's an explanation, but it just, it takes time to whip out my paper and stuff. It's, it's fine. I'll be explaining things in future, but let's go ahead with this one. Okay, so, I mean, like I said, this is a standard thing. I've been through it so many times, but the basic idea is this is solving for the T value of the ray at which it intersects the sphere. And that comes down to solving a quadratic equation. So a handy test to see if we've got a solution is simply to check whether the system is solvable, which hinges on the discriminant. So now let's go ahead and use that above. So the first thing I want to do is I want to work out, this will tell me the position that I have on the screen, but I also want to work out how big the screen is. Then what I want to do is I want to find the proportion to the left or right or up or down that the pixel is on the screen. I'm going to name this horizontal coefficient. So what I'll do is I will subtract, I'll subtract half of the screen size, and then I'll take all of that and divide it by, yeah, half of the screen size. But then of course, dividing by something, divide by two is really the same as doubling the numerator. So we'll just go ahead and double all the terms in the numerator, and that will do the same thing. Now I'll go ahead and do the same thing for the vertical coefficient. So I'll take the Y position, we'll subtract half of the screen size in the Y, and then we'll still divide by the screen size in the X. And the reason for that is that the, the viewport is uneven. In order to maintain the correct ax, uh, aspect ratio, we'll simply divide by the larger dimension, and that'll be perfectly fine. So. There we go. Um, now this horizontal coefficient will be normalized between negative one and one, and same thing with the vertical. So we can actually use those as coefficients to orient the ray and get its direction. But anyway, before we get to that, we'll just set up a camera. Okay, and then we'll set up a sphere.
and finally a ray. So the ray is going to be oriented at the camera's position facing in the camera's direction. So getting the position is easy enough. And then in order to set the direction, it will be a vector sum of the camera's forwards. But then the coefficients there will be the horizontal and vertical respectively. Just quickly survey my work. I think that's fine. That's probably fine. Okay, so now what I'll do is I'll just test to see if that ray has in fact hit the sphere. And if it has, we'll just, yeah, we'll send the sphere color to the screen. Okay, good. So now we'll just quickly run that. And we could potentially be running into some issues, so I'll just run it in terminal mode. Nope, no errors. Okay. Excellent. So let's give that a go. Whoop, there we go. Very nice, very nice. So that's it. But from this little acorn, big things will grow. So thank you for sticking through it. We got the sphere on the screen. Yeah, let me know what you'd like to see next. In, oh, we'll see. I'm thinking just a whole lot of spheres. That sounds like a logical progression. Anyway, so as always, have a great time, and I'll see you again soon. Keep coding. Anyway, bye.